In the annals of military history, few names stand as tall as Heinz Guderian, a man whose vision and ingenuity reshaped the very nature of warfare. Born into an era of trench warfare and stagnant front lines, Guderian looked beyond the traditional strategies that had defined conflict for centuries. He saw the future in steel, speed and relentless momentum, but who was this man and how did his revolutionary ideas forever change the way wars would be fought? A lesser known general, Oswald Lutz, would guide Guderian and without Lutz there would be no Guderian. Lutz would take Guderian under his wing. Lutz and Guderian's impact on warfare is undeniable. His vision paved the way for the modern battlefield, where speed, technology and coordination reign supreme. As a young boy and cadet at the Kadettenanstalt, Heinz Guderian was often characterised by his teachers as always serious or very serious. Early in life, he developed a reputation for being concise and clear in his speech, often to the point of being cold and cutting when he wished. A quality that made him both feared and respected, Guderian was solitary, making no friends until he assumed his first command. During World War I, when his radio station was overrun at the Marne due to the incompetence of his division commander, Guderian, then a lieutenant, wrote a scathing report on the incident. The report could have ended his military career, but fortune favoured him when his division commander fell out of favour shortly thereafter due to an unnecessary retreat. Guderian's career was frequently marked by his fiery temper, which often landed him in difficult situations. Despite this, his exceptional military abilities did not go unnoticed and he was repeatedly saved by superiors who recognised his potential, even as they noted his lack of temper control. Throughout his career, Guderian often disobeyed orders from his superiors. They frequently attempted to slow his advances, worried about his exposed flanks and the slow progress of the infantry, which could not keep pace with the tanks. Guderian, however, understood that armoured warfare was fundamentally different. In his view, the concept of flanks was less relevant, and delaying the advance was a grave error. The German Wehrmacht was a competitive environment where officers vied for glory, and this too contributed to attempts to restrain Guderian's rapid advances. Despite these challenges, Guderian remained popular among his soldiers. Many photos captured Guderian smiling on the front lines, surrounded by his troops, his expression one of encouragement as if saying, quote, follow me and gain glory, end quote. However, when photographed with his staff or superior officers, Guderian's smile was noticeably absent. Guderian's soldiers and officers admired him deeply because he was always present with them on the battlefield, and they trusted his knowledge as much as he shared in their experiences. His proficiency as a commander was not a result of recklessness or sheer intuition, as it was for Erwin Rommel, but rather stemmed from a profound and detailed understanding of armoured warfare. Guderian knew the exact capabilities of each tank, the types of terrain they could traverse, where they would slow down and where they could accelerate. This expertise was a direct result of his role as the architect of the German Panzerwaffe, a creation that, despite its significance, was never fully appreciated by the German high command.
Heinz Wilhelm Guderian, a name synonymous with the evolution of armoured warfare, was born on June 17, 1888, in the small town of Kulm, West Prussia, an area that was then part of the German Empire and is now known as Chelmno, Poland. Nestled along the Vistula River, just south of what is now Dansk, Kulm was a place steeped in military tradition. The proximity to strategic waterways and the storied landscapes of Prussia would, in a way, foreshadow the path young Heinz would eventually tread. Guderian's upbringing was deeply rooted in military discipline. Between 1901 and 1907, he honed his skills and intellect at various prestigious military institutions, including the renowned Military Academy in Berlin. These years were formative, instilling in him a keen understanding of military strategy and tactics that would later define his career. By 1907, Guderian had joined Jaeger Battalion 10, a light infantry unit comparable to today's elite US Ranger battalions for example. This battalion was under the command of none other than his father, a seasoned military officer. The connection to his father's command was both a privilege and a challenge, pushing Heinz to prove himself beyond mere nepotism. After completing rigorous training at the war school in Metz, then a symbol of German military power in Lorraine, Guderian was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1908. His commission was backdated to 1906, an honour reflecting his exceptional performance and commitment. He returned to Jaeger Battalion No. 10, where he began to develop the leadership skills and tactical acumen that would later revolutionise modern warfare. In 1911, a personal chapter unfolded in Guderian's life when he met Margareta Gurn, a woman who would become his steadfast companion. Their love story, however, faced a hurdle when Gudrian's father, concerned about his son's youth and burgeoning career, insisted that Heinz was too young to marry. This led to Guderian's transfer to Telegraph Battalion No. 3, where he received specialised training in communications, a critical skill that would later play a crucial role in his development of Blitzkrieg tactics. In 1913, having completed his training and now equipped with a broader set of military skills, Guderian married Margaret. The union not only marked a new chapter in his personal life, but also the beginning of a legacy that would extend through his sons. The couple had two sons, Heinz Gunther and Kurt, both of whom would follow in their father's footsteps, serving in the Panzertruppen during World War II. Heinz Gunther, the elder son, distinguished himself in the Bundeswehr, eventually rising to the rank of Major General, a testament to the enduring military tradition of the Guderian family. Guderian's early life, steeped in the traditions of Prussian military discipline and enriched by personal experiences, laid the foundation for his future as one of the most innovative and influential military leaders of the 20th century. His ability to merge the lessons of his rigorous training with the demands of modern warfare would later manifest in the creation of the Blitzkrieg strategy, forever changing the face of warfare. Until the outbreak of World War I, Heinz Guderian was sent to the War Academy in Berlin for staff training due to his exceptional promise. In November 1914, he was promoted to First Lieutenant, and just a year later, he rose to the rank of Captain. Although Guderian never commanded a combat unit during the war, he served in various assignments on the Western Front, witnessing pivotal battles such as the disaster at the Marne and the carnage of Verdun. His performance earned him the Iron Cross, second and first class, as his Funken station, radio station, sometimes came under enemy fire and had to fight its way out. In early 1918, Guderian was evaluated during the Sedan course, where his innovative problem-solving abilities left a strong impression on his instructors. As a result, he was selected for the general staff of the Army High Command, becoming the youngest staff officer. After the war, Guderian was integrated into the Reichswehr, the German military force limited to 100,000 men by the Treaty of Versailles, which only retained the most capable soldiers. He began writing extensively on motorization and was assigned to lead various motorized units, which at the time were primarily logistics units equipped with trucks and motorcycles. In 1927, Guderian was promoted to the rank of Major, during this period, Guderian immersed himself in the study of motorised warfare. Fluent in French and English, he translated the works of military theorists such as Captain B. H. Liddell Hart and Major General J. F. C. Fuller. His innovative approach included equipping trucks with wooden turrets armed with guns and manoeuvring them as if they were tanks, although this was initially forbidden by his superiors. 
General Oswald Lutz was an early advocate of mechanized and armored warfare. After World War I, Lutz recognized the potential of tanks and other armored vehicles to revolutionize the battlefield. In the 1920s and early 1930s, as the head of the transport troops department in the Reichswehr, the German army during the Weimar Republic, Lutz was in a position to influence the development of Germany's armored forces. Lutz played a significant role in laying the groundwork for what would later become the Panzer Divisions. He believed in the integration of tanks with motorized infantry, artillery and air support to create a fast-moving, decisive force capable of deep penetrations into enemy territory. His vision for armoured warfare was modern and forward-thinking, especially given the constraints imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles, which severely limited the size and capabilities of the German military. Heinz Guderian, often called the father of Blitzkrieg, was significantly influenced by Lutz. Guderian was an officer under Lutz's command and shared his enthusiasm for armoured warfare. Under Lutz's mentorship, Guderian developed his ideas about the use of tanks and motorised infantry in a combined arms approach. While Lutz provided the broad vision and administrative support necessary to develop Germany's armoured forces, Guderian was more of a hands-on tactician and innovator. Lutz and Guderian worked closely together to refine the concepts of armoured warfare. Lutz provided the institutional support and advocated for the development of the panzer divisions within the German army. He used his position to push for the expansion of armoured units, even during a time when the German military was officially limited by the Treaty of Versailles. Lutz's mentorship was crucial in Guderian's development as a military theorist and leader. Lutz recognized Guderian's talent early on and provided him with opportunities to test and implement his ideas. For example, when Lutz became the inspector of motorized troops in 1931, he ensured that Guderian was involved in key positions where he could influence the development of armored tactics. Lutz also protected Guderian and his ideas from bureaucratic resistance within the army. At a time when traditionalists in the military were skeptical of the new mechanized warfare concepts, Lutz used his authority to support and promote Guderian's innovations. So let me tell you, without Lutz this wouldn't have been possible. It's largely a myth that Guderian did this all by himself and calls himself the father of Blitzkrieg when others were just as involved in laying the stepping stones for Guderian. In 1929, Guderian travelled to Sweden to observe a tank battalion equipped with STRV M21 and M21-29 tanks, Swedish adaptations of the German LK2. He also visited the secret tank testing facility in Kazan, Russia, where he met Russian officers who would later become his adversaries. At this time, Guderian was in charge of the Truppenamt Abteilung Heeres Transport, the command overseeing all motorized transport units, and also served as a tactics instructor in Berlin, specializing in motorized warfare. In February 1931, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and two years later to Colonel. Guderian continued to write extensively on armored and motorized warfare, contributing to the development of Germany's first tanks. When Adolf Hitler ascended to power in 1933, the German military landscape began to shift dramatically. Amidst these changes, one officer's innovative approach caught Hitler's eye, Heinz Guderian. During a demonstration of military maneuvers involving small Panzer I tanks, Hitler observed Guderian's tactics with fascination. The display was a bold defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, which had strictly limited Germany's military capabilities. Yet, the treaty's constraints did little to stifle Hitler's ambitions or Guderian's vision. The future Führer was thrilled by what he saw, an agile, modern force that could reshape the battlefield. Emboldened by this display and driven by his own militaristic goals, Hitler took drastic steps to rearm Germany. He reinstated conscription and authorized the creation of three panzer divisions, signaling a clear break from the restrictions imposed after World War I. Guderian, whose innovative ideas and deep understanding of armored warfare had quickly gained Hitler's favor, was entrusted with significant responsibility. He was appointed commander of the 2nd Panzer Division, a role that placed him at the forefront of Germany's armored resurgence. His rapid ascent in rank followed with a promotion to Major General. 
Guderian's star continued to rise at an astonishing pace. Within a year and a half, he was promoted to Lieutenant General, assuming command of the 16th Army Corps. In this position, Guderian's influence over Germany's military strategy grew even stronger. He was instrumental in orchestrating two key events that would mark Germany's aggressive expansion in Europe. The Anschluss, which saw Austria annexed into the Third Reich, and the invasion of the Sudetenland, the German-speaking region of Czechoslovakia. Both operations were executed with precision, underscoring Guderian's belief in speed, surprise and overwhelming force, principles that would later define Blitzkrieg. In recognition of his contributions and the success of these campaigns, Guderian was promoted once again, this time to the rank of full general, General der Panzertruppen. Along with this promotion came a critical assignment that would shape the future of Germany's military might, Chef der Schnellentruppen or Chief of Fast Troops. This role was more than just a title, it was a testament to Guderian's unparalleled expertise in mechanized warfare. As Chief of Fast Troops, Guderian was responsible for the recruitment, training, tactics and development of all the Wehrmacht's motorized and armored units, with the exception of the tracked infantry assault guns. Under his guidance, these units evolved into the feared Panzer divisions that would soon spearhead Germany's campaigns across Europe. Guderian's strategic brilliance was on full display during the invasion of Poland in September 1939, a conflict that marked the beginning of World War II. As commander of the 19th Army Corps, Guderian led his forces with the characteristic speed and precision that had become his trademark. The campaign not only showcased the effectiveness of Germany's panzer divisions, but also solidified Guderian's reputation as a master of modern warfare. His leadership in Poland earned him several high honours, including the Iron Cross, Second and First Class, awards he had previously received during World War I, and the prestigious Knight's Cross, a recognition of his extraordinary contributions to the German war effort. Guderian's role in these early successes laid the groundwork for what would become the Blitzkrieg strategy, a lightning-fast form of warfare that would dominate much of Europe in the early years of the conflict. His vision and leadership transformed Germany's armoured forces into a formidable weapon, one that would challenge and often overwhelm the conventional armies of Europe, and will change the dynamic of modern warfare as we once knew it. Heinz Guderian was a complex and brilliant military figure, whose career was defined by his unwavering self-confidence and innovative approach to the use of technology in warfare. His early experiences in World War I revealed the audacity and forward thinking that would come to characterise his later achievements. As a young officer, Guderian took the extraordinary step of personally flying over the Ardennes in a fragile biplane, a daring move that reflected his deep desire to understand the battlefield from a first-hand perspective. This reconnaissance mission was more than a simple flight. It provided Guderian with a critical understanding of the enemy formations and the challenging terrain his troops faced. The insights he gained from this experience would become invaluable years later, when his tanks would sweep through the very same Ardennes, catching the Allies off guard and playing a pivotal role in pinning them against the French coast during the early stages of World War II. Guderian's brilliance lay not only in his tactical prowess, but also in his early recognition of the transformative power of new technologies. He was among the first to understand the revolutionary potential of radio communications in warfare, at a time when many military leaders still relied on slower, more traditional methods of communication, Guderian saw that radios could ensure the precise and coordinated movement of tanks across the battlefield. This technological innovation allowed him to lead from the front lines where he could directly observe the unfolding battle and make real-time decisions. By being close to the action, Guderian could feel the pulse of the battlefield, adapting his tactics to the fluid and dynamic nature of combat a hallmark of his leadership style. His enthusiasm for technology was not limited to communication. 
Guderian also recognised the broader implications of mechanisation in warfare. His fluency in English and French enabled him to delve deeply into the works of military theorists from other countries, broadening his strategic horizons. Additionally, Guderian was influenced by the ideas of Charles de Gaulle, a young French officer who, like Guderian, saw the potential for tanks to revolutionise military strategy. These intellectual pursuits were not just academic exercises, they were the foundation of Guderian's vision for modern warfare. He became a passionate advocate for the use of tanks and motorised vehicles, arguing that they could provide the speed and flexibility needed to outmanoeuvre traditional infantry-based armies. His ideas were initially met with scepticism by some of his superiors, but Guderian's persistence paid off. By the time World War II began, he had helped transform the German military into a formidable force, capable of executing the lightning-fast, mechanised assaults that would become known as Blitzkrieg. J.F.C. Fuller was a pivotal figure in the evolution of modern armoured warfare, and his contributions were particularly influential during and after World War I. One of Fuller's most notable achievements was his role in planning the successful British tank attack at the Battle of Cambrai in 1917, a landmark event that showcased the potential of tanks in breaking through entrenched enemy positions. This battle marked a turning point in military tactics, as it was one of the first large-scale demonstrations of what tanks could achieve when used effectively. Fuller didn't stop at Cambrai. He was also the first to develop a comprehensive doctrine for armoured warfare known as Plan 1919. In this plan, Fuller envisioned the tank as a decisive weapon capable of revolutionising warfare by compensating for the slow and vulnerable advance of infantry. He saw tanks as a combination of armour, firepower and mobility, able to withstand enemy fire, overpower defensive positions and rupture the front lines. His innovative strategy emphasised deep penetration into enemy territory, arguing that such manoeuvres would create confusion and panic, ultimately leading to the collapse of the entire enemy front. Fuller's approach was built on the principles of surprise, concentration of force and mobility, ideas that would later become central to the doctrine of Blitzkrieg. B. H. Liddell Hart, another key figure in the development of mechanised warfare, served in World War I and later became a vocal advocate for the integration of tanks and air power in military strategy. Through his prolific writings, Liddell Hart argued that future wars would be dominated by these elements, moving away from the static trench warfare that had characterised much of World War I. He championed the concept of striking at the weakest point in the enemy's defences with a concentrated, disruptive blow, a strategy intended to unbalance the opponent and accelerate their defeat. Little Hart's vision involved armoured units penetrating deep behind enemy lines, operating far ahead of the main body of the army to create chaos and disarray, ultimately leading to a swift and decisive victory. Ironically, while these innovative ideas were born in Britain, it was the German military that would most effectively develop and implement them during the interwar years. Heinz Guderian in particular was deeply influenced by the theories of Fuller and Liddell Hart. Guderian took these ideas and transformed them into the operational doctrine that would power the German Blitzkrieg during World War II. He understood that tanks, when used in combination with coordinated air support and fast-moving infantry, could deliver the kind of rapid, penetrating assaults that Fuller and Little Hart had envisioned, leading to the lightning-fast conquests that characterised the early years of the war. Meanwhile, in France, Charles de Gaulle also recognised the transformative potential of mechanised warfare, even as he found himself constrained by the more traditional military culture of the interwar French army, which remained deeply rooted in the legacy of cavalry. Despite these institutional challenges, de Gaulle became an advocate for the use of tanks, arguing for their integration into a modern mechanised force. His efforts during the German invasion of France in 1940, particularly in the counter-attacks against Guderian's forces during the drive from Sedan between May 17-20, 1940, demonstrated his commitment to these ideas. Although de Gaulle's actions were ultimately unable to halt the German advance, they highlighted the validity of the armoured warfare concepts that Fuller and Little Hart had championed. The tragic irony was that while the Allies had developed the foundational theories of mechanised warfare, it was the Germans under Guderian's leadership who fully realised and exploited these concepts on the battlefield. This effective adoption and adaptation of Allied theories contributed significantly to the early successes of the German military during World War II.
showing how the right application of strategy and technology could decisively alter the course of conflict. Heinz Guderian was a man of extraordinary drive and ambition, traits that propelled him forward in a military career marked by innovation and strategic vision. His timing was impeccable as Adolf Hitler's rise to power in the early 1930s provided the perfect backdrop for Guderian to bring his revolutionary ideas on modern warfare to fruition. The synergy between Guderian's forward-thinking approach to military technology and Hitler's aggressive ambitions to rebuild Germany's military strength after the limitations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles created a unique opportunity. Guderian's disdain for the static uh, trench warfare of World War I aligned perfectly with the German regime's desire for rapid, decisive victories that would reshape Europe's political landscape. In an interesting twist of fate, it was Lutz who, in late 1936, suggested that Guderian compile his thoughts and lectures into a book, a suggestion that led to the creation of Achtung Panzer. This seminal work was more than just a collection of Guderian's lectures from the War Academy. It was a comprehensive analysis of armoured warfare, integrating the theories of other military thinkers while also presenting Guderian's own vision for the future of mechanised combat. Achtung Panzer not only established Guderian as one of the foremost authorities on armoured warfare, but also served as a blueprint for the tactics that would later dominate World War II. The book's influence was profound, offering a detailed roadmap for the development and deployment of panzer divisions that would become the spearhead of Germany's Blitzkrieg strategy. The effectiveness of these panzer units was put to the test during the March 1938 Anschluss with Austria, where Guderian's theories were dramatically validated. The swift and decisive nature of the operation, in which panzer units played a crucial role, demonstrated the power of armoured warfare and the strategic advantage it could provide. This success not only solidified the importance of Guderian's ideas within the German military, but also elevated his standing within the German regime. As Guderian's influence grew, so too did his proximity to the centres of power. He began receiving rare and significant social invitations, including opportunities to dine and attend the opera with Adolf Hitler himself. These invitations were more than just social niceties, they were a clear signal of Guderian's growing importance within the inner circles of the German leadership. His ideas were no longer just military theories, they were integral to Germany's military strategy as the nation prepared for the conflicts that would soon Gulf Europe. Guderian's rise within the German hierarchy and his increasing influence on military strategy were testaments to his vision and ambition. He was a key architect of the panzer divisions that would become synonymous with Blitzkrieg and his ideas would shape the course of World War II, leaving a lasting legacy on the history of warfare. Heinz Guderian's favour with Adolf Hitler was indeed a critical factor in his meteoric rise within the German military hierarchy in the lead up to World War II. This relationship not only provided Guderian with the opportunities to implement his revolutionary ideas, but also allowed him to navigate the complex and often treacherous waters of German military politics. Initially, during the planning stages of the August 1939 invasion of Poland, Guderian was assigned to command a second-line defensive infantry corps, a position that he found deeply unsatisfactory given his ambition and belief in the power of mechanised warfare. Guderian understood that his future and the success of his ideas depended on his ability to command a more dynamic and strategically significant unit. Using his political connections and the influence he had cultivated within the German regime, Guderian manoeuvred his way into a more suitable role, ultimately being reassigned to command an untested motorised corps. This corps, although less prestigious than the renowned 16th Corps, uh, that had earned him recognition during the Anschluss in Austria, provided Guderian with the platform he needed to prove the effectiveness of his concepts on the battlefield. Guderian's motorised corps proved to be a decisive force during the Polish campaign. His innovative use of fast-moving, coordinated armoured units overwhelmed the Polish defences, showcasing the potential of blitzkrieg tactics. On September 5th, 1939, as the campaign was unfolding, Guderian hosted a battlefield tour for Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler and a young infantry officer named Erwin Rommel, who would later rise to fame as the Desert Fox. During this tour, Guderian passionately advocated for the idea that armoured units, rather than traditional infantry or artillery, would be the decisive force in modern warfare. His arguments were compelling, and the success of his motorised corps during the campaign only reinforced his position. 
A quick learner and confident innovator, Guderian didn't just excel in implementing existing strategies, he was instrumental in shaping them. One of his most significant contributions to the German war effort came when he threw his support behind General Erich von Manstein's audacious plan to use tanks to penetrate the heavily forested Ardennes. This manoeuvre, which became known as the Sickle Cut, was a daring and unconventional strategy that aimed to bypass the heavily fortified Maginot Line by slicing through the weakly defended Ardennes Forest. The plan was to push through to the English Channel, thereby trapping the bulk of the Allied forces in Belgium and Holland. Guderian's execution of this plan was nothing short of brilliant. His tanks moved with lightning speed, cutting through the Ardennes and driving towards the channel, effectively encircling the Allied forces. But Guderian didn't stop there. After reaching the channel, he pivoted south towards the Swiss border, executing a massive envelopment that trapped over 500,000 French soldiers. This manoeuvre was a key factor in the rapid collapse of France, bringing the war on the Western Front to an abrupt and devastating end. Guderian's ability to adapt, innovate and execute complex military operations with precision made him one of the most formidable commanders of World War II. His favour with Hitler, combined with his strategic brilliance, allowed him to transform his vision of armoured warfare into reality, reshaping the course of the war and leaving an indelible mark on military history. Heinz Guderian's military acumen was vividly demonstrated during the early stages of Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, as part of the ambitious Operation Barbarossa. Tasked with leading the central thrust towards Moscow, Guderian's Panzer Group executed a series of rapid and decisive operations that would leave a profound impact on the course of the campaign. From the outset, Guderian's forces moved with remarkable speed and precision. His panzer units quickly crossed three major rivers, the Bug, the Dnieper and the Berezina, spearheading the advance into Soviet territory. In a stunning display of blitzkrieg tactics, Guderian's troops encircled and captured approximately 300,000 Soviet soldiers in the Minsk pocket, a devastating blow to the Red Army. Following this triumph, his panzers pressed on, capturing the key cities of Minsk and Smolensk. These victories were not only strategic, but also resulted in the capture of another 300,000 Soviet soldiers, along with a staggering haul of 3,200 tanks and over 3,000 artillery pieces. By this stage, Guderian's forces had advanced roughly 400 miles into Soviet territory, bringing them within striking distance of Moscow, just 175 miles away. However, in a controversial and strategically significant decision, Guderian's panzer group was redirected on August 21, 1941, approximately 200 miles south, to assist in the encirclement of Soviet forces during the Battle of Kiev. This move, though it delayed the push towards Moscow, proved devastating for the Red Army. The Kiev operation culminated in one of the largest encirclements in military history, resulting in the capture of another 660,000 Soviet soldiers and the destruction of an estimated 880 tanks and 3,700 guns. The scale of the victory at Kiev was immense, dealing a severe blow to Soviet military capabilities and demonstrating the effectiveness of Guderian's armoured tactics. With the Kiev operation concluded, Guderian's tank units retraced their steps and resumed the advance on Moscow on September 30th. The panzers moved with astonishing speed, capturing the city of Oral on October 3rd. The German advance was so swift that the city's trams were still operating when Guderian's forces entered, a testament to the shock and awe tactics that characterised his approach. Just four days later, the Germans encircled the Bryansk pocket, capturing more than 660,000 Soviet soldiers in yet another devastating blow to the Red Army. Despite these impressive successes, Guderian's advance on Moscow began to falter as the campaign wore on. The worsening weather, with the onset of the infamous Russian winter, compounded by severe logistical challenges and increasingly determined Soviet resistance, slowed the German advance to a crawl. Guderian's attempt to capture Tula, a critical city south of Moscow, ended in failure, and by December 4, 1941, he was forced to shift his forces to a defensive posture. This retreat came just as the Soviets launched a fierce counter-offensive, bolstered by fresh Siberian troops and the powerful new T-34 medium tanks, which outmatched German armour in both firepower and mobility.
Guderian, recognising the dire situation, made the difficult decision to pull back his forces to more defensible positions, an action he took without prior authorization from Hitler. This decision, though tactically sound, infuriated Hitler, who was adamantly opposed to any form of retreat. The resulting clash between Guderian and Hitler culminated in Guderian's dismissal on December 26, 1941. Despite the contentious nature of his removal, Guderian's contributions to the early stages of Operation Barbarossa underscored his formidable skill as a military strategist. His leadership during the invasion, particularly in the application of blitzkrieg tactics, played a pivotal role in Germany's initial successes on the Eastern Front. Though the ultimate failure to capture Moscow marked the beginning of a long and gruelling war that would eventually turn against Germany. In many respects, Heinz Guderian's dismissal in December 1941 turned out to be a fortuitous event, sparing him from the direct association with some of the most significant defeats suffered by the Axis powers during World War II. These included the disastrous campaign in North Africa, the gruelling retreat from Moscow and the catastrophic loss of the 6th Army at Stalingrad. However, Guderian's military career experienced a remarkable resurgence when, on February 28, 1943, Hitler appointed him as the Inspector General of Armoured Troops. This prestigious role charged Guderian with the critical task of reorganising the Panzer forces and accelerating the production of heavier, more advanced tanks, a responsibility he embraced with the same vigour and determination that had characterised his earlier successes. Returning to a position of influence after two years away from the battlefield, Guderian quickly made his mark. Known for his fiery temperament, which had earned him the nickname Stormy Weather Heinz, Guderian did not shy away from expressing his strong opinions, even in his new Role. While he was not directly involved in planning the mid-1943 Citadel Offensive, which culminated in the Battle of Kursk, Guderian was outspoken in his criticism of the strategy and the deployment of certain armoured vehicles. He opposed the use of the Heavy Elephant and Nashorn tank destroyers and voiced serious concerns about the premature deployment of the new Tiger and Panther tanks. Guderian believed these tanks, particularly the Panthers, had unresolved mechanical issues that could jeopardise their effectiveness in combat. Guderian's warnings were tragically validated during the Battle of Kursk, one of the largest tank battles in history. The performance of the Panther tanks at Kursk highlighted the very problems Guderian had anticipated. Out of the 200 new Panthers that were deployed in the battle, 42 were destroyed, and by the time the Germans were forced to withdraw, only 43 remained operational. The rest had been rendered inoperative due to mechanical failures or battle damage, underlining the tank's lack of readiness for the intense demands of the battlefield. The Panthers' disappointing debut at Kursk served as a harsh lesson in the dangers of deploying unproven technology too quickly. Despite the setbacks at Kursk, Guderian did not waver in his commitment to revitalising Germany's armoured forces. He pushed forward with his reorganisation efforts and played a key role in significantly boosting the production of Panther tanks. By the end of 1943, Germany had produced around 1,800 Panthers, with another 1,400 rolling off the production lines by May 1944. Guderian's relentless drive ensured that the German Panzer divisions remained a formidable force, even as the overall strategic situation for Germany became increasingly dire. Guderian's influence extended beyond his role as Inspector General of Armoured Troops. After the failed assassination attempt on Hitler on July 20th, 1944, Guderian was appointed Acting Chief of the General Staff, a position that thrust him into the heart of Germany's increasingly desperate war effort. In this capacity, Guderian faced a nearly impossible task, coordinating the German defence against relentless Soviet advances in the east, managing the mounting pressure from Allied forces in the west, and dealing with the devastating effects of Allied bombing campaigns that were crippling Germany's industrial capacity. The worsening conditions of the war, coupled with Guderian's ongoing clashes with Hitler over military strategy, led to his second dismissal on March 28, 1945, just weeks before the collapse of the Third Reich. One of the most intriguing and contentious aspects of Heinz Guderian's life is his potential involvement in the conspiracy to assassinate Adolf Hitler. While Guderian's own memoirs acknowledge some level of interaction with the conspirators during his period of unemployment between 1942 and 1943, he downplays his role, insisting that he eventually distanced himself from the plot due to his belief that it lacked sufficient chances of success. 
According to Guderian, the risks to his career and life outweighed any potential benefit of participating in such a dangerous undertaking. However, despite his apparent reservations, Guderian made a critical decision that could have had dire consequences under German justice. He did not report the conspirators. Historian Russell Hart has scrutinised Guderian's account and argues that there is strong circumstantial evidence suggesting that Guderian may have been more involved in the conspiracy than he was willing to admit. One of the key pieces of evidence Hart points to is Guderian's recommendation in June 1944 that Colonel Klaus Graf von Stauffenberg, the eventual leader of the assassination plot, be appointed as the army's chief of staff. This position would have granted Stauffenberg direct access to Hitler, potentially making it easier for him to carry out the assassination. Guderian's recommendation raises questions about his true level of support for the conspirators and whether he was quietly facilitating their plans. Further evidence that Guderian may have been closer to the plot than he later claimed comes from an incident on July 19, 1944, just one day before Stauffenberg's failed attempt to kill Hitler. On this day, Guderian was reportedly informed of the impending plot by Lieutenant Colonel Karl Henning von Barsowisch, a former Luftwaffe liaison officer. Barsowisch made a final effort to enlist Guderian's participation in the conspiracy, but Guderian failed to report this meeting. In his memoirs, Guderian later dismissed the information as too incredible to take seriously. Historian Russell Hart writes a lot about it in his Heinz Guderian book, a defence that Hart criticises as bordering on the absurd given the gravity of the situation and the atmosphere of suspicion and intrigue that surrounded the Nazi leadership at the time. Hart also examines Guderian's actions on July 20th, 1944, the day of Stauffenberg's failed assassination attempt. On that fateful day, Guderian travelled from Berlin to his estate in Diepenhof, West Prussia, where he spent the afternoon hunting Roebuck alone on his property. According to Hart, this timing provided Guderian with a critical window to assess the unfolding situation. By being away from Berlin and effectively out of contact for several crucial hours, Guderian could wait to see if the plot succeeded before taking any decisive action. It was only later in the afternoon, when a dispatch rider finally located him, that Guderian learned of the plot's failure via radio. Once he understood that the assassination had not succeeded, Guderian quickly took steps to distance himself from any suspicion of involvement. Hart's analysis raises significant questions about the extent of Guderian's knowledge of and potential involvement in the conspiracy against Hitler. While Guderian's memoirs attempt to present him as either ignorant of or indifferent to the plot, the evidence suggests that he may have been more deeply connected to it than he admitted. Whether Guderian's actions on July 20th were part of a calculated effort to protect himself or simply a coincidence remains a matter of historical debate. However, the circumstances surrounding his behaviour certainly cast doubt on his claim of non-involvement, leaving room for speculation that Guderian was more complicit in the conspiracy than he was ever willing to acknowledge publicly. The question of Guderian's involvement in the plot against Hitler adds a layer of complexity to his legacy. It challenges the image he sought to project in his post-war writings and invites further exploration into the moral and ethical decisions faced by military leaders under the Nazi regime. Whether Guderian was a cautious conspirator or merely an opportunist who deftly navigated the dangerous political landscape of the Third Reich, his actions during this period continued continue to provoke intrigue and debate among historians. The day after the failed July 20th, 1944 assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler, a still shaken Führer made a significant and telling decision by promoting Heinz Guderian to the position of acting chief of the general staff. This appointment placed Guderian at the very heart of the German military apparatus during one of the most tumultuous periods of the war. In addition to this powerful position, Hitler also appointed Guderian to the Honor Corps, a body charged with the grim task of screening and expelling members of the armed forces suspected of involvement in the conspiracy against Hitler. The Honor Court's decisions carried dire consequences. Officers expelled by the court were handed over to the Gestapo, where they faced brutal interrogations, often involving torture. Following this, they were tried by the notorious People's Court, where justice was a mere formality, and executions were carried out in the most brutal manner imaginable, by slow strangulation with piano wire, a method deliberately designed to maximise suffering and serve as a deterrent to others. Guderian's participation in the Honor Court is particularly troubling, especially when considered alongside the possibility that he may have had prior knowledge of the assassination plot. 
His role on the court involved voting to expel fellow officers based solely on evidence provided by Gestapo interrogations and intelligence reports. The accused were not given the opportunity to defend themselves or present witnesses, a stark departure from any semblance of justice or fairness. This raises significant ethical questions about Guderian's complicity in the persecution of his peers and casts a shadow over his legacy. Adding to the complexity of Guderian's legacy are his actions during his period of inactivity in 1942-1943, when he sought to secure property in conquered territories. During this time, Guderian pursued the acquisition of a substantial estate, ultimately settling on a 2,500 acre property of prime farmland at Diepenhof. The Polish owners of this land were forcibly evicted to make way for Guderian's claim. Hitler himself approved the acquisition, viewing such gifts as a means to secure the loyalty of his military commanders. Historian Russell Hart describes this estate as the largest single bribe Hitler ever gave to any of his field commanders. Moreover, since August 1940, Guderian had been receiving special tax-free monthly payments of 2,000 Reichsmarks, effectively doubling his gross salary. As World War II drew to a close, the relationship between Heinz Guderian and Adolf Hitler became increasingly strained, leading to a series of tense and dramatic confrontations. One of the most notable of these occurred on February 13, 1945, during a critical meeting at the Chancellery in Berlin. At this time, Guderian was serving as the acting chief of the general staff, a position that placed him at the forefront of Germany's rapidly deteriorating war effort. During the meeting, Guderian presented intelligence that indicated the Soviet forces were capable of reinforcing their positions along the River Oder by up to four divisions per day, creating a situation that required an immediate and decisive counterattack. Guderian, ever the pragmatist, strongly advocated for swift military action. He insisted that General Walter Wenck, a capable and experienced officer, be attached to Heinrich Himmler's army group staff to lead the defense. Guderian made it clear that he believed Himmler, despite his high rank and political power lacked the military experience and competent staff necessary to manage such a critical operation effectively. This blunt assessment did not sit well with Hitler, who took offence at the implication that his trusted lieutenant was not up to the task. The confrontation quickly escalated, with Hitler becoming increasingly enraged, his face contorted with anger, veins bulging at his temples as he hurled accusations at Guderian. The argument lasted for two intense hours, with Hitler venting his fury while Guderian, unyielding and composed, repeated his demands with unwavering determination. This standoff was a rare and remarkable moment in the history of the Third Reich, a seasoned and battle-tested general standing his ground against the Fuhrer, resolutely advocating for the measures he believed were necessary to defend Germany against the advancing Soviet forces. As Guderian stood his ground, he couldn't help but notice the symbolic presence of historical figures in the room. Above the fireplace, a portrait of Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, loomed large, its steel helmet catching the firelight. At the other end of the room, a bronze bust of General Paul von Hindenburg, the World War I hero and former president, stood in silent judgment. These figures, representing Germany's military and political past, seemed to question the decisions being made in that moment. Eventually, Hitler, perhaps sensing the gravity of the situation or the futility of further resistance, relented. He announced that General Wenck would join Himmler's headquarters that very night to oversee the counterattack. The operation commenced two days later and initially showed promise. However, Wenck was severely injured in a car accident shortly thereafter, depriving the operation of its crucial leadership. Without Wenck's guidance, the attack quickly lost momentum, allowing the Soviets to regain the upper hand. The Red Army's relentless advance, combined with the pressure from Allied forces pressing in from the West, soon led to the inevitable collapse of the Third Reich. Earlier, in February 1945, Guderian had also vehemently opposed Hitler's broader strategic plans. He argued that German troops should be evacuated from the Balkans, Italy, Norway and particularly from the Courland Pocket along the Baltic to reinforce the defence of the Fatherland. Guderian believed that these redeployments were essential, especially in light of the failed Ardennes offensive in the west and the relentless Soviet advance in the east. However, Hitler reacted with fury to these suggestions. According to Guderian's account, Hitler was so enraged that he shook his fists dangerously close to Guderian's face, prompting Guderian's assistant to discreetly pull the general back by the bottom of his jacket to prevent a physical confrontation. 
Despite Guderian's efforts to advocate for a more pragmatic and strategically sound defence, the result of this confrontation was not the redeployment of vital troops, but rather a limited and ultimately inconsequential attack in the Arnswald area. This operation, aimed at holding Pomerania and maintaining a link with Guderian's native Prussia, had minimal strategic significance and did little to alter the course of the war. The overwhelming advances of the Soviet and Allied forces continued unabated. The final meeting took place on March 28, 1945, in the cramped air raid shelter of the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. The atmosphere was already tense, as the Soviet forces were only a few kilometres away from Berlin, and the German High Command was under immense pressure. The purpose of the meeting was to analyse the reasons behind the failure of a recent German offensive near Kustrin, which was intended to reopen a corridor between German lines and the positions they still held. The meeting was attended by several high-ranking officers, including General Theodor Busse, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, General Alfred Jodl and General Hans Krebs, along with Hitler and Guderian. The discussion began with General Busser, who was responsible for carrying out the failed offensive. As Busser started to explain the execution of the attack and the forces involved, Hitler abruptly interrupted him. In a furious tone, Hitler demanded to know why the attack had failed. Without giving Busser a chance to respond, Hitler answered his own question by accusing Busser of incompetence and negligence. He asserted that the attack had been launched without sufficient artillery preparation, which, in his view, was the primary reason for its failure. Hitler then turned his ire toward Guderian, questioning why Bus had not been provided with more ammunition if, as reported, there had been a shortage. Guderian, already under significant stress, attempted to respond, but Hitler cut him off almost immediately. The Führer dismissed Guderian's attempt to explain, accusing him of offering nothing but excuses and demanding to know who was truly responsible for the failure at Kustrin, Busser or the troops. At this point, Guderian, visibly angered, shot back at Hitler. He rejected the notion that Busser was to blame, pointing out that Busser had only followed orders and had used all the ammunition and resources available to him. Guderian's frustration boiled over as he accused Hitler of unfairly blaming the troops who had suffered heavy casualties in the offensive. He cited an estimate of 8,000 German casualties to underscore the sacrifices made by the soldiers. Hitler, undeterred by Guderian's defence, responded with equal fury. He shouted that the troops had failed and that was the only fact that mattered. By now, both men were standing close to each other, their faces almost touching, each shouting at the other. Guderian, his face red with rage, roared at Hitler, demanding that he stop making baseless accusations against Boozer and his troops. The confrontation had escalated to the point where it seemed a physical altercation might break out between the two men. The argument continued to intensify, with both Hitler and Guderian hurling accusations and insults at each other. Hitler, in his anger, claimed that his general staff was full of lazy and incompetent people who constantly misinformed him and left him disoriented about the true state of the war. Sensing an opportunity, Guderian brought up a previous report by General Reinhard Galen, which had warned of an imminent Soviet attack on the Vistula River in January. Hitler had dismissed this report at the time, considering it exaggerated and unrealistic. Guderian now pointedly asked Hitler whether he believed he had been misinformed on that occasion as well. Hitler, still enraged, dismissed Galen as crazy and deflected the question by bringing up the 18 divisions that were still trapped in Courland. He demanded to know when Guderian intended to evacuate these forces. Guderian, equally furious, responded by challenging Hitler's decision-making once more, leading to another heated exchange. By this point, the argument had reached such a fever pitch that General Busser, who was supposed to be the focus of the meeting, later recalled being completely paralysed by the intensity of the confrontation. He had never witnessed anything like it before. Fearing that the situation might spiral out of control, General Jodl intervened, grabbing Guderian by the arm and urging him to calm down. Guderian's assistant, sensing the danger of the moment, orchestrated a fake telephone call to provide Guderian with an excuse to leave the room. Reluctantly, Guderian exited the meeting, remaining outside for about 15 minutes to cool off. During this time, Hitler, who had collapsed into a chair from the stress of the argument, also took the opportunity to recover. When Guderian returned, Hitler had everyone else leave the room, leaving only Keitel, Guderian and himself. In a more controlled tone, Hitler informed Guderian that his health required him to take six weeks of convalescent leave. 
He insisted that Guderian should do everything possible to recover because the situation would be critical in six weeks and his services would be needed urgently. Field Marshal Keitel then asked Guderian where he planned to go during his leave, to which Guderian replied that he had not decided yet but would choose a location where the Allies would not appear for at least 48 hours. The meeting concluded shortly afterward and Guderian left, never to hold another position in the German military for the remainder of the war. He would eventually surrender to the Americans on May 10th, 1945. This intense and explosive confrontation between Hitler and Guderian was one of the most dramatic moments in the final days of the Third Reich, highlighting the desperation and disarray within the German High Command as the war drew to a close. Fast forward to the late 20th century and the principles Guderian and others created found new life in the Gulf War. In 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the United States and a coalition of allies faced the task of liberating Kuwait and neutralizing Iraqi forces. US military planners, aware of the historical success of Blitzkrieg, the sheer power of the complete overwhelming force was adapted again, its core principles to modern warfare, incorporating advances in technology and weaponry that had occurred since World War II. The Gulf War strategy, like Blitzkrieg, relied on speed, surprise and overwhelming force. Operation Desert Storm began with a massive air campaign designed to destroy Iraq's command and control infrastructure, air defences and communication networks. This initial phase was crucial in establishing air superiority, a key component of both Blitzkrieg and its modern iteration. The air campaign also sought to demoralise Iraqi forces and diminish their ability to coordinate an effective defence. Following the air campaign, the coalition launched a swift and powerful ground offensive. Using highly mobile units such as the US Army's 7th Corps and the 18th Airborne Corps, coalition forces executed what has been called a left hook manoeuvre, a wide flanking movement that struck at the heart of the Iraqi positions from the west. This manoeuvre echoed the Blitzkrieg tactic of bypassing strong points to strike at the enemy's rear and flanks, cutting off supply lines and causing widespread disarray. The speed and precision of the coalition's ground assault mirrored the rapid, mechanised advances of German panzer divisions in 1940 and 1941, forcing the Iraqi military into disorganised retreat within days. The speed and effectiveness of the coalition's tank-led ground assault were critical in overwhelming Iraqi forces. The Abrams tanks, with their advanced fire control systems and heavy armour, could engage and destroy Iraqi tanks from greater distances and with greater accuracy. This technological edge allowed the coalition forces to maintain the momentum of their advance, creating the kind of disarray and panic that Blitzkrieg tactics had historically exploited. 
The psychological impact of this rapid, overwhelming assault was profound. Iraqi forces, already demoralized by weeks of relentless air bombardment, were further disheartened by the unstoppable advance of coalition tanks, the speed of the coalition's offensive and the devastating effectiveness of their armoured units led to the rapid collapse of Iraqi resistance. Just as Blitzkrieg had aimed to break the will of the enemy quickly, the Gulf War's strategy sought to do the same, leaving Iraqi forces with little choice but to surrender or flee. One of the key strategies developed by NATO was the concept of forward defence, particularly along the Central Front, which included Germany's heavily fortified border regions. The idea was to position NATO forces as far forward as possible, close to the Iron Curtain, to meet any Soviet invasion at the earliest possible moment. This positioning was meant to delay and disrupt the momentum of a Soviet advance, much like how defenders would aim to slow down a blitzkrieg assault by attacking the spearhead formations and causing disorganization. Organization. In this context, NATO's use of armoured units such as the M60 Patton and later the Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks was directly inspired by the lessons of World War II. These tanks were deployed to counter the massive Soviet tank armies and were expected to engage in high-speed, mobile warfare. The emphasis was on maintaining the ability to respond rapidly to any breakthrough, ensuring that NATO forces could match the speed and mobility of any Soviet assault, just as the Germans had used their tanks to outmaneuver their opponents during World War II. As NATO's understanding of the potential Soviet threat evolved, so too did its military doctrines. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, NATO adopted the Airland Battle Doctrine, which was explicitly designed to counter the possibility of a Soviet blitzkrieg type. This doctrine emphasised the integration of air and ground forces, much like the combined arms approach of lightning war, to create a highly coordinated and flexible response to any Soviet invasion. Air land battle called for deep strikes behind enemy lines, using both air power and ground forces to disrupt Soviet command and control, supply lines and reinforcements. This was directly inspired by the Blitzkrieg's focus on bypassing strong points and striking deep into enemy territory to cause chaos and disarray. NATO's goal was to prevent the Soviet forces from achieving the kind of rapid breakthroughs that had characterised German blitzkrieg operations. By striking deep and disrupting the Soviet advance, NATO aimed to slow down the assault and buy time for reinforcements, and a more robust defensive posture to be established. The Blitzkrieg strategy was built upon several core principles that have profoundly influenced military doctrine and strategy throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. These principles include the integration of fast-moving, mechanised infantry, concentrated tank formations and close air support. The goal was to create shock and confusion within enemy ranks, leading to rapid advances and the encirclement of enemy forces. By exploiting breakthroughs quickly and relentlessly, Blitzkrieg sought to prevent the enemy from regrouping or mounting an effective defence. Guderian's contributions to Blitzkrieg were not merely tactical, but also deeply strategic. He understood that modern warfare required a departure from the static, defensive mindsets that had dominated previous conflicts. Blitzkrieg emphasised offensive operations, where the aim was not just to hold ground, but to constantly disrupt and outmanoeuvre the enemy. This shift from a defensive to an offensive paradigm required not only new tactics, but also a new way of thinking about war itself. As stated, the impact of Blitzkrieg extended far beyond World War II, influencing military thought and practice in numerous conflicts and theatres of war. During the Cold War, NATO's military doctrines were heavily shaped by the need to counter potential Soviet advances using principles akin to Blitzkrieg. The Arab-Israeli conflicts, particularly the Six-Day War in 1967, saw the successful application of Blitzkrieg-like tactics, where speed and surprise played crucial roles in the Israeli Defense Forces' victories. Defending against Blitzkrieg has also driven significant developments in military doctrine. The recognition that traditional defensive lines could be quickly overrun led to the development of more flexible, mobile defenses designed to absorb and counter rapid advances.
Modern armies have increasingly focused on anti-tank warfare, air superiority and electronic warfare as means to disrupt the critical elements of Blitzkrieg, mobility and communication. The development of Blitzkrieg not only revolutionised warfare during World War II, but also set the stage for the evolution of military strategy in the decades that followed, and to this very day, the principles of speed, surprise and combined arms operations continue to shape how wars are fought and defended against in the modern era, proving that Blitzkrieg's legacy is both enduring and transformative in the annals of military history. And with that, we wrap up this video. Thank you so much for sticking around. It's been a fascinating journey and I hope you've learned something new. If you enjoyed the content, please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Both really help me out. A big thank you to my patrons for their support. All the links are down below, including my Instagram where I post daily content. I hope to see you in the next video. Take care and goodbye for now.